Happy Palm Sunday. If you would grab a Bible or a device by which you can access the Bible and open up to Mark's Gospel, the Gospel of Mark. Pop quiz. Where is Mark in the order of the Gospels? Is he first, second, third, or fourth? Second. Second. That's good. Okay, as you're finding Mark, turn to Mark chapter 11. Maybe another quick question. Out of all four gospel writers, this is just a yes or no, are all four gospel writers original of the 12 disciples? No, no that's not a well-known fact. I thought, I grew up in church, I knew a guy who taught the Bible, and I didn't even know that until like later in my life. I was like, oh yeah, there's all the disciples, and then I started thinking, wait a second, Luke, where did he come from? Mark, wait, what's going on? Interesting that they're not all of the 12, that God used other individuals. That has nothing to do with Palm Sunday, but hopefully now you're in Mark chapter 11. Or if you're there, let me know by saying Jesus is alive. alive. Okay. Well, on Palm Sunday, at least for us here at Coastline and for many brothers and sisters who name Jesus as Savior and Lord around the globe, Palm Sunday does for us kind of mark this time, well of what many call Passion Week, the week before Jesus goes to the cross and then eventually rises from the dead on Easter Sunday. But also Palm Sunday, it marks what's known as the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. And here's what I would say. Palm Sunday marks, it marks the height of Jesus' ministry for his ultimate mission. You say, what's his ultimate mission? Let me put it up for you on the screen. This comes from Luke 19. For the Son of Man, a name that Jesus would often ascribe to himself that comes from the Old Testament, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are, what does it say there? Lost. Lost. Okay, I know about that. I know what it's like to be lost. I know what it's like to be alone. I know what it's like to not care anymore. I know what that's like. I know what that's like to live in the desert physically and be lost. So here's my question. All right, Jesus, that's what you say. You say that you've come to seek and to save the lost. Really? How are you going to do that? Well, some would say he did it through his teachings, did it through his healings and his miracles and his life example, and even his death. Some might say, yes, so what about that? Like that helps me in life. Like if I follow the rhythms of life that Jesus followed, it's helpful. Like if you get up in the morning to pray, that's a good thing. It's going to help you. If you make the Word of God a priority of your life, if you make community, fasting, the rhythms that Jesus had in his life, if you make practicing the way of Jesus part of your life, you're going to benefit from that. But does it save you? Yes and no. What do you mean? It brings a bit of zoe to your life. Life, the Greek word for life in the New Testament. But Jesus died. Do you happen to know? Here's another question. Were there any other people in history that died on the cross? Yes or no? Yeah. Were they great people, wonderful people? No. People that died on the cross primarily died due to punishment. And it was reserved for the most grotesque individuals in the eyes of those who were distributing this punishment. So the life and death of Jesus, does that, does that save me? Yes. Absolutely. But... Every man dies, right, William Wallace? So how does Jesus accomplish his mission? 
See, here's what I find so interesting. All four Gospels place a tremendous amount of significance on this week. Listen to the percentage that is dedicated to this week from the Gospel of Matthew. 40% of the content in the Gospel of Matthew is about this last week. 60% of the Gospel of Mark. Nearly 50% of the Gospel of John and nearly a third of the Gospel of Luke are focused on this last week. Not his healings, not his fasting, not his prayers, but this last week. Now, I'm not that smart, but when I hear like all these percentages, whoa, this must be something. And like every gospel account focuses upon this dynamic this week, this Sunday, Palm Sunday. Now, this week as a church, we're going to celebrate three primary days, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday. But here's my question. Does anybody like M&Ms? I like M&Ms. I love M&Ms. In fact, what I did this morning as I got up early for some situations and then after those situations, I went to the store and I was like, you know what? I want to see what's on sale at my local grocer for Easter. And you know what I've learned? They know how to market to the South. <laughs> it's a chocolate cross and a chocolate bunny, right? Like that, that candy's there. But also, you know what my kids love? I don't know if your kids love these. My kids love them some peeps. Do you like peeps? Does anyone know what a peep is? It's all natural, all organic. Yeah, no. <laughs> But also kind of another staple in our life is these. Do you know about these? Oh, someone was like about to say amen. They're like, I love church. Yes, amen. Cadbury eggs. Well, here's what I've learned about M&Ms. M&Ms, man, they're moving forward. Did you know how many different kinds of ways they can take a hard shell and cover milk chocolate? There's like a whole kiosk to different M&Ms now. Have you seen that? I had never seen chocolate bark M&Ms. Like there's all, they even make a bag now that has peanut butter, peanut, and she's saying yes, and plain. Like they're all in one bag. So you're like, I don't even have to make it. I can just go for it. I don't have to get three bags. I can get one bag. Now you say, why in the world did you buy these candies? Well, you can see why I bought. No, no, no. Why are you bringing it up on a Sunday morning? Why at this juncture? If I were to give a title to our time together, the next 35 minutes or so, here's what I would say. The M&M's of Easter. I say, what do you mean by that? Palm Sunday, where we are today, I firmly believe is the message of Jesus. On this day, Jesus is definitively communicating a message. And then on Good Friday, by the method of the cross... He begins to fulfill his mission. To seek and save the lost, he had to die. You see, the message of Jesus is on Palm Sunday. The method by which Jesus saves the world is Good Friday. And the miracle of Jesus, his resurrection, validates his method and his message. Palm Sunday is like your first response when I said happy Palm Sunday. Nah. Palm Sunday means nothing without Easter Sunday. Good Friday means nothing without Easter Sunday. But with Easter Sunday, listen to me, church. Hear me now. This message means everything. Have you ever been asked, ever been told, ever been kind of put into a corner Jesus didn't believe he was the Son of God. He never claimed to be Messiah. First, know what kind of fight you're in. Here's the fight you're in. That individual's burden of proof is upon them. If they make the statement of accusation, get into the courtroom. It is upon them to thus prove or provide evidence for said claim. Not you. That's a tactic of the enemy who hates you. To make you feel like you've got to get on your heels. When someone comes against you, say, show me the evidence. That's a wonderful statement. Love to hear that you're thinking. Provide content for me. 
Today, you're going to be given three questions to ask someone who says, Jesus never really. Let's go to Mark 11. Let me show you the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus, what I hope to share today, is that without a pulpit, without a program, without even an Instagram, Jesus proclaims a message through the reception and recognition of others identifying him as Messiah. Jesus, this master communicator, preaches a message without words. He is publicly, clearly, loudly, unashamedly declared Messiah. The greatest question to be answered in your life is who is Jesus? Because listen, Jesus doesn't have any grandbabies. Just because mama or auntie or uncle or so-and-so is a Christian doesn't mean nothing for you. You must come to the foot of the cross like everyone else and become his child. Be found, be forgiven, be free, become part of his family and be entrusted with the promise that you have a future. And so hear me. This is an important question for you. And Chronicles of Narnia answers it for you. Say, what do you mean by that? C.S. Lewis, the author of said work, once posed this statement. With Jesus, there's only a handful of options. He's a liar. He's a lunatic. Or he's Lord. And today you will see that this text leaves you with such a quandary. Where will you land when it comes to Jesus? Because unlike all those others, and listen, I had to read the Upanishads, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tao Te Ching, to graduate with my associates from Santa Barbara City College for some reason that was part of my prerequisite. And some of those individuals will claim, well, Jesus is a way, but so is this, and so is this, and so is this, and so is this. The only one who said, I am the way, is Jesus. So this guy's a liar, or he's a lunatic, or he's right. He is not a good man. That's not on the table for you. That's not an option. You can't have my peeps. That's not an option for you. You get it? See what I'm saying? Like Jesus being a good man, it's not on the table for you. With what he claims... And what he proclaims, he's either crazy or he is the Christ. And I believe Mark 11, verses 1 through 11, in the next 25 minutes that we have together, will share that with you. So let's do this. Let me ask you to stand with me since you're nice and cozy. And let's read Mark 11, 1 through 11. You read in your head. I'll read aloud. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. We'll say a quick prayer after reading and break this down. Verse 1, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there. As soon as you enter it, you'll see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Now, if you're a student of Scripture, this is weird. Nowhere else in Scripture is Jesus ever concerned about his mode of transportation. Why all of a sudden is he like, hey, I want you to go over there. I need a donkey to ride on. And they're like, this is like Obi-Wan to Luke. Like, what? 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 Like, you have no need? Like, it's what? What? And Jesus says in verse 3, if anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. This is not a verse to take out of context when you see a Lamborghini or a lollipop or something you want. Go, hey, the Lord has need. No, you can't use that. Verse 4, the two disciples left and found, gosh, they found exactly what Jesus said, the colt standing in the street tied outside the front door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing? doing? Did you get the tone? It's the tone of Karen. Do you understand what I mean? Like, it's not the tone of like, oh, what what say you? No, it's more like, what are you doing? Untying the colt. And and look, verse 6, look what it says. They said what Jesus had told them to say. (laughs) And they were permitted to take it. 
Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Now, I want you to get this. This is very important. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Where is Jesus in the midst of this? Pay attention to verse 9. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and all the people were shouting, Praise God! Blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem, went into the temple, and after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon, and he returned to Bethany with his 12 disciples. Let's pray. Father, as we've opened your word, I ask that you would open our hearts. Help us to lean in. Help us to listen and learn so that we can love and live and lead just like Jesus, so that we don't have to be lost, but be found. I pray you'd open up the ears of those who have ears to hear today and shut those who don't. Help this not to be a time that's wasted on us, but to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Allow those, Lord, whom you are seeking after to reach back out to you. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, interesting text. A bit mystical. Jesus with his disciples telling them to go into town and to find a donkey. And then if anyone asks, just kind of say the Lord has need of it. And these are not the droids you're looking for kind of a thing. And that's what happens. Jesus gets on this donkey, rides into the city of Jerusalem. And, and as you read, people throw their cloaks and coats and outer garments and they're waving palm branches. It's a big and busy time for Jerusalem. You might wonder why, when it says that there's large numbers, it's during the Feast of Passover. That was the, um, the time frame that the people of God got together and thanked God for the deliverance that they experienced from the land of Egypt. And now he had the angel of death pass over them because of the blood that was on the doorposts of their homes. You know, it's interesting. There's a, a secular historian by the name of Josephus, and he writes that during the mid-first century, when this is set in history and time, that there was an official tally taken of over 250,000 sacrificial lambs slain in Jerusalem during Passover. Now, we know from God's Word and other resources that often 10 people could be represented by one lamb. So for the mathematicians in the room, 250,000 lambs, one lamb can represent up to 10 people, potentially. How many people are maybe in Jerusalem? Yeah, two and a half million people could have been thronged into Jerusalem. Just like Gulf Breeze, they didn't have the infrastructure to maintain the growth, right? That's what's going on there. It's crowded. There's red cones everywhere. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, goodness, this is chaos. And now Jesus is coming in. I wish I could describe the tone to you. But D.A. Carson explains it well. Let me read it to you. He says this. The Passover feast was to the Jews what 4th of July is to Americans. It was a rallying point of intense nationalistic zeal. This goes some way to explaining the fervor that they tried to force Jesus to become king. There's a large crowd. They'd seen his miracles. I think many within the crowd probably thought he was the Messiah. For, again, for those of you that have read the Bible, maybe you kind of know where we are in the life of Jesus. Just before Jesus rides on the donkey into Jerusalem, do you know where he was before that? He was with Mary and Martha. 
Does anyone remember what miracle happened with, old, with the sisters and their brother? He literally raised Lazarus, the one whom the old King James says, by Lord, no, Lord, by now he stinketh. Like, don't raise him. You know, that's kind of the sister's approach. But like, he raises Lazarus from the dead. Many historians believe that Lazarus is walking with Jesus into Jerusalem on that day. So people got to be like, do you, do you see what's happening? Like, <laughs> Jesus is coming to town. He, he, he's coming to town. And Lazarus, this guy, he just rose from the dead. He's coming with him. This is powerful. It's so powerful that they cut down these palm branches, begin waving them, and they're shouting. Look at verse 9 and 10 one more time. Praise God. Blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessing on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest. Can you sense to some degree the anticipation and the expectation of the people? This is 4th of July, man. And here comes our conqueror. Here comes our Messiah. He's even raising people from the dead. The Romans don't stand a chance. Now, I shared with you that I would give you three tools, three questions to ask those that may say, Jesus never claimed. Let me give you the first question. Why then did Jesus need a donkey? This is the question to ask. I mean, think about the way Jesus often traveled. He didn't ride a horse. That was a Roman thing, very expensive to do. He, he wasn't carried around on a couch with cushions by the apostles or in a chariot or a cart. How did he get around? Does anyone know? He walked. He walked. Palm Sunday is the only time in his life where we have communication that he took a different form of transport. Why? See, if you're a student of Scripture and you notice something that's kind of like off the wall, like, why is this happening? Ask questions. Hundreds of years before this arrival, listen to what the prophet Zechariah wrote. Chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. And listen to this description. It's almost like a dichotomy. You say, what do you mean? Your king comes to you righteous and victorious and lowly. Have you ever met anyone who's righteous, victorious, and lowly? I never have. Like all those things together, those like sometimes are like oil and water. But this is Jesus, one who is right, one who actually had victory and lowly. What? And what's he doing? He's riding on a Tesla. No, donkey, right? He's riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Why a donkey? To come riding in on a donkey as opposed to a war horse meant that Jesus was coming in as a man of peace. He didn't come as a conquering general, but as a suffering servant. And because Jesus here is making a statement, listen to me, a bold statement. In fulfilling this prophecy, Jesus accomplished at least two things. He is declaring himself by saying, go get me that donkey. I'm going to fulfill Zechariah 9.9. Side note, did not mention this in first service, but for those that like to read, I would encourage you to read and look up the author Peter Stoner, who was over the mathematics department in Westmont College near Montecito, California. He did an interesting statistical analysis of the probability of Jesus fulfilling a handful of prophecies. Did you know that you had a better chance this weekend of winning the Power Bowl than Jesus doing this stuff? Why is he doing this? He's declaring himself to be the king, the Messiah, and he's also doing this. He's deliberately challenging the religious leaders. He's right and he's lowly. He's victorious and he's humble. But humility is not apathy. Humility is not passivity. Humility is not allowing evil to go unchecked. Jesus held those who were in charge accountable. And that's what he does here. Why a donkey? 
Jesus is declaring publicly and loudly without a word, without a pulpit, without a program, that he is the one that they should be expecting. He is their king. He is their Messiah. He's on a donkey, not a noble steed, not a war horse, but he's the king. Not Buddha, nor Muhammad, nor Confucius, none of these guys claim to be king. But right here, if you know anything about Jewish culture, anything about Jewish history, anything about the archaeology, we're going to look at that in just a moment, of this time, it's definitive, it's loud, it's clear. Jesus is making a statement. When someone comes to you and says, Jesus never claimed, they're either uneducated, uninitiated, lazy, or looking for an excuse for their sin. Or they're just not informed. But culture helps. History helps. Archaeology helps. Remember Jay Seegert? Man, I put it in this way. Ship. You want to know which boat to get in religiously, if you want to call Christianity that? One that can be backed up by science, by historical evidence, by internal consistency within its documentation, and by prophecy. There's only one book that can do that. One boat worth getting in, the Bible. One ship to step into and set sail, the Word of God. I mean, has anyone ever gotten together like 40 different people from different generations on different continents, gotten them all to agree on something? That's insane. These 66 books of the Bible, it's insane. The consistency of it, the veracity of it, the history of it. When someone comes against your word of God, the one that you cling to, where your faith is in, don't be on your heels. You know what Charles Spurgeon used to say about the Bible? He said, the Bible, I don't need to defend it. The Bible's like a lion. I just need to let it out of its cage and let it have its way. The word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's actually living and active. I wish there was a church that cared so much about you and the Bible, that every day they made a two-minute devotional so that you could get into God's Word and never have an excuse that you can't listen and learn the Bible. It's, a, it's kind of a hard thing for you if you go to Coastline because there's this huge amount of accountability now. Hey, there was this church that helped you learn the Bible. Did you, did you take it? Did you do it? I'd encourage you to do it. It's really, really good for you. It's really, really good for you. The better you know the Word of God, the better you're able to discern the spirits and the Spirit of God. Because not every spirit is of the Spirit of God. There are principalities and powers and evil and darkness in this world. Read Ephesians 6. Read 2 Timothy 3. It will get darker and harder before it gets lighter and brighter. But that doesn't matter for us. Why? Why? Because we know the one who set us free. We know the one who's forgiven us. We know the one who has our future set. And we believe on the authority of God's word that if God is for us, who can? Yeah, some of us believe that. Some of us believe that. There's freedom in knowing God's word. I'd encourage you to get into it. Well, why did he need a donkey? Well, that's the message. What's up with the palms? Here's the second question. First, why, why the donkey? Number two, why the palms? Let me read something to you because I want to honor your time. I'll put it up on the screen. Judas Maccabeus. For those of you that don't know your history, here's a little bit of history about the Jewish uh, people. Judas Maccabeus miraculously led Israel into a victory. This is 200 years before Palm Sunday over a different kind of occupation. It's the Syrians. And upon their victory, the crowds celebrated. How did they celebrate? By plucking palm branches off trees and waving them ecstatically. An ocean of waving branches did more to capture the essence of that moment than anything else. Children and grandparents, soldiers and girlfriends, vine dressers and stonemasons rushed into Jerusalem waving palm branches. The picture was unforgettable. In fact, so memorable was the moment of freedom and national dignity that Judas, also known as the hammer, stamped an image of a palm branch into their coins, 
symbolizing victory for the Jews over an occupational force. The palm branch from that point forward was minted onto the temple coinage as a reminder of what really mattered. The palm branch. It's not like they were riding into Coastline Calvary Chapel on a Sunday and going, man, let's get some palm branches. See them all around here? Like, it's not, that's not why they did that. It's like, oh, there's just a bunch of palm trees around. It's hot. There's two and a half million people here. Come on, let's just wait. No, 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 no. The palm branch was an icon of Israel's freedom. Waving a palm branch would be for us on 4th of July, waving the stars and stripes. Eating a hot dog. Watching that scene from Sandlot. You know, like, it's just nostalgic. Like, that's just where they are. It's like, we're proud to be. That's the moment here. It's patriotic. It goes back to their history. You know, you can go to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, and there are, in fact, several coins from the first and second century stamped with the image of a palm tree, and this is what it says on that coin, for the freedom of Jerusalem. The palm branch. Do you get it? He's fulfilling a prophecy, declaring a message. They're waving palm branches. And look at verse 9. This is where we ask the third question. Where is Jesus in the midst of all of this? Is he like every other angel, every other prophet in the Bible when they start to receive worship and they're like, no, 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 don't give me that, don't give me that. What does verse 9 say about where Jesus is positioned? He's right in the center of it. He's receiving it. He's in the center of the procession, and all the people around him are shouting, praise God. In the New King James, it says they're shouting, Hosanna. Now, what does that word mean? It's quoted in Psalm 118, and originally, anyone ever heard of the word etymology, like the history of a word? Okay, two people. Well, it just means the history of the word, and and this is basically the history of the word Hosanna. It, It literally just means save. I don't know if you know this, in, like maybe in the 21st century, words change. Did you know that? Like their meaning. Like there's this one word called, or two words, I guess, no cap. Does anyone know what that means? Or mid. You don't know. Okay, this is a different thing. Or like cool. Like that's a word that's changed over time. Okay, we won't get into all these generational things. Or heavy or hip or far out. Yes, maybe. Okay, no one knows these. Far out, man. Did you ever see a heavy... Back to the future. Okay, we're getting way off case here. Um, What is this about? What does it mean? Originally, the word Hosanna just meant save, help, I'm struggling. And I used to grow up thinking, why in the world do we sing these songs? Hosanna, Hosanna, save, save. I'm like, we're like, I don't get this. Well, then I read this. Let me read it to you. It used to mean save, please. But gradually it came to mean salvation, salvation, salvation has come. It used to be what you would say when you fell off the diving board. But it came to be what you would say when you would see the lifeguard coming to save you. It's the bubbling over of a heart that sees hope and joy and salvation on the way and can't keep it in. For some, they could have been in that original meaning of the word, save us. And others are like, he's here. He's saving us. Hosanna. They're excited. They're shouting. They're waving the stars and stripes. Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. And the people that knew God's word but were like porcupines, a lot of good points, but no one wanted to be around them, the Pharisees, you know what happened? In Luke 19, they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples, because they know what's going on. And listen to what Luke writes. It's in verse 40 of chapter 19. Jesus saw no need to rebuke those who told the truth. Listen to those who told the truth. He replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones are going to cry out. Jesus never claimed to be God. What did he say? If I stop them, nature's going to start saying it. Here's the deal. Why did Jesus need a donkey? Zechariah 9.9. 9. 
See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. The message is the Messiah. The palms, symbol of freedom, symbol of a conqueror. What are they shouting and why? Hosanna. Salvation is here. And what is Jesus doing? He's receiving it. That guy's loony. Or he's a liar. Or he's Lord. Those are your options. And these three days, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday, they go together not just in sequence. Please hear me on this. But as a full expression and declaration of who Jesus is. These are the M&Ms of Easter. Palm Sunday, the message of Jesus. Good Friday, the method by which Jesus saves the world. Easter Sunday, the miracle by which he validates his method and message. And these M's give us meaning and the ability to be made new. Now, why does all this matter? Because humanity's primary need is spiritual. You know this, right? The three institutions that God has foreordained for humanity to provide governance, guidance, and guardrails. The family, the church, and the government. These are not bad. These are not wrong. These are institutions that are God-ordained. But get first things first. What should be healthy first? You. You, spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally healthy. We live on, a, we live on the wrong side of Genesis chapter 3. I get that. Sin is in the world. That doesn't mean you can't live a healthy lifestyle spiritually. And here's what I would say. Spiritual health comes before political health, not the other way around. And the way forward is to do them in sequence. First, let's reach the individual. Then let's reach the family. Then let's reach the church. Then you allow the government to be under God's authority. Does that make sense? It doesn't to the 21st century America. We got it so backwards. The ones that need to step up are the ones sitting down. And to lead yourself well. Did you know that the first thing you were given stewardship over in life is you? And the book of Jeremiah says this, You must stop saying my teeth are set on edge because my parents ate sour grapes. Stop using your past to excuse your current behavior. Eventually, you must take responsibility for your life. If you were of Jewish culture, it's at age 13. You're a man now. Take responsibility. Everything has an explanation of the why. But don't take an explanation and make it an excuse. Because Benjamin Franklin, you know what he said, right? The one who is good with excuses is seldom good with anything else. The message and the method and the miracle of Jesus, they give your life and my life meaning. Listen, you don't know me. You don't know me at age 19. You don't know me at age 20. You know me at age 42. I was a different person at age 19. Lost. Lost. Wounded did not care about my life or anyone else's. I know what it's like to feel dead. And I also know what it's like to be found. I know what it's like to be forgiven. I know what it's like to find freedom. I know what it's like to finally have a function in God's kingdom. And I know what it's like to have fun because I know where my future ultimately ends. You can too. You're not so far gone. You're not so bad. God's grace is greater. 
The power of the cross. Let me read this to you. This is going to come from Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. So what did God do? Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave you of all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us. And what did he do? He took it away. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. And I would encourage you, get like a, go to Blue Letter Bible and look up verse 15 in the original language. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers. You know what that means? It means he took the nose of the enemy and he rubbed it in the dirt through the cross. Verse 15 says he disarmed the spiritual rulers. He shamed them. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them. How? On the cross. The method of Jesus is powerful. The cross is what saves us because of the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus. And if I can leave you with one last thought, here it is. It's going to be this. A whole lot of M's. Here they are. Because of the message and method and miracle of Jesus, we can live lives that are made new, given ultimate meaning in our lives and the safety and surety that we're being made until one day we're fully mature and in his presence forevermore. So this week, be a messenger of this truth. This is where it lands. Your week was not random. You are being made. Read the Bible. You're God's poema, his masterpiece. It means he's working on you through relationships, through circumstances, through highs and lows, through lack, through joy, through suffering. Don't run from suffering. Martin Luther once said, affliction is the best book in my library. Suffering is your friend. I know it's hard to see that. I know that's hard. But you grow from it. Nobody respects anything that comes easy, not even you. But when there's struggle and strength is produced, Paul wrote it this way in Galatians, don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, if you don't give up, you'll reap. Listen to me now. Are you struggling? Are you abased? Get in line. We all are. We're all fighting some battle that you don't see. We all got ghosts and gouges in our life. Ghosts where there used to be a relationship there, but it's not the same. When you've lived for a little bit, there's scars. Warren Wearsby put it this way. There's bumps in life, but the bumps are what you build on. That is so true. Listen, God is working in your life. But it's like a tapestry. Do you know tapestry? Where the back side is all like knotted. It looks gnarly. That's the side you and I see. And God sees the other side. Look, do you see what I'm making? Hang in there. Hang in there. You see, because of the M&Ms of Easter, you can know that you can be made new. And that you're currently being made. You're being sanctified. And your life has purpose. It has meaning. And one day, you're going to be fully mature. You know what that day is? That's your heaven's day. Where you're finally who God's made you to be. And then where do you go? His presence forevermore.